I welcome all of you who come to worship on this glorious Easter Sunday morning and say welcome to those who join us online. This morning's call to worship comes from Psalm 118 and your response is in yellow as usual. Christ is risen. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. Let those who fear the Lord say, The Lord is our strength and our defense. The Lord is God, and He has made His light shine on us. Give thanks to the Lord. So let's rise if you are able to sing our first song, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Thank you. 
and let's pray. <clears throat> Mighty God, we gather to celebrate your greatness, to praise your faithfulness. We give thanks to you for sustaining us and loving us with an everlasting love and giving us the light of the knowledge of your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. On this joyful Easter morning, we confess that at times we do not share in the joy of the resurrection, but are caught in the worries of the world and our lives. We confess that we do not always live in the spirit of new life, but remain discontent and anxious. Forgive us when we find it more comfortable to worry and complain than to risk the joy and encouragement of new life in Christ. Forgive us for our reluctance to share the good news. Loving God, teach us to know the mystery of your suffering love that gives us life. Strengthen us with knowing that all our dying and living is held in your good keeping and call us back to your ways to seek hope and reconciliation, restoration and peace. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. And we sing the second song, this is the day of a new beginning. While we sing, while singing, those who have flowers come forward to decorate the cross. And we sing as we sit.
And George will pray for the world and for us. Thanks, George. This morning as I pray, I'll read out my uh, prayer and then I'll have a, allow a period of uh, silence for you to pray your own personal prayer and then we'll join together in the Lord's Prayer. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we praise you that you know our failings and have mercy on us and you embrace us through our, your Son, Jesus. Son of God, we praise you that you have demonstrated the impossible to understand depth of commitment to our salvation and our eternal presence in your glory. Holy Spirit, our comforter, our guide, our ever-present teacher, counsellor and voice of truth, we praise you that we are never apart from God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Open our hearts, calm our souls, unclutter our minds and allow us to know you more clearly and see, see your suffering self in this hurting world and strengthen us to lovingly touch this world. God of the impossible, we yearn for peace. We yearn for suffering to end. We yearn for a world free from fear, pain and hopelessness. We ask the impossible, that Israel, Palestine, Gaza can put down their arms and find true reconciliation and astound the world that you deliver the impossible. Jesus, King of the world, we yearn for freedom from aggressive, destructive people in power from the warring generals in Sudan, the crime bosses in Haiti, the drug bosses here in Australia, all fermenting violence, chaos, fear, killing. We pray, Jesus, that your power, love and life-changing presence may overwhelm the actions of man who see that crushing the weak and powerless as the way to success. Holy Spirit, our personal companion and voice, we hide our own weaknesses, we display our pride, we ignore fellow man. Holy Spirit, Cloak us in the full armour of God. Shield us from those who seek to prevent us being the people you want us to be. Feed us with insights and confidence to be the best people we can be. Open our hearts to those we meet who are struggling and do the impossible by making us your vessel for giving light, your compassion, humble service and, in, and giving wisdom in a, in a manner that we may not understand but may be life-changing for those whom we meet. Father God, Lord of the impossible, may we walk with you to deliver the impossible to those you love. 
And let us share our own personal prayer in silence. Lord, our personal prayers continue and your listening ear and loving hand remains with us always. And as we continue to pray, let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory, yours, now and forever. Amen. And let's join in singing our next hymn, Community of Christ. Please remain seated.
and let's pray. Receive these our gifts of gratitude and hope. Gratitude for all that you provide, hope for the world of your making and remaking. May this offering be used wisely. May it contribute fruitfully. Amen. Thanks, Elizabeth. She's already here. Pastoral care and notices. Isn't it lovely when we have our family members with us today? We've got a lovely lot of family members up there. So gorgeous, gorgeous to see you all. Now, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Somebody asked me, could we please explain to those of you who are new or who have forgotten um, about our beautiful, beautiful Easter banner that we have up there. The Easter banner was designed by church members Jan Harris and the late Joan Friedman and was sewn by Margaret Grinton, our wonderful sewer. The blood red cross and the tears portray the events of Good Friday. The ray of light depicts the new dawn of Easter Sunday. The sunflowers turn their heads to the east in preparation for the new dawn. But 25 years ago, that space on the wall was left bare. And the story is, on Australia Day in 1999, the Northern Territory town of Catherine suffered a disastrous flood. Our congregation received a letter from one of our former parishioners, Megan Thomas, describing the devastation suffered by the town and by the uniting church building. As Easter was approaching, our banner makers decided to send our Easter banner to Catherine as a gesture of caring and support. So in 1999, the place where the Easter banner belonged was bare, and we thought of the congregation in Catherine. And this one is a replacement banner of the same design that was ready for our church the following year. And may I add, one, that year, I think, um, the Cormac family happened to be holidaying up there and went into the church and there was the banner and they were absolutely thrilled. So thanks, Lorraine, for keeping all that information for us. It was a moving time here. Now, just very quickly, as from tomorrow, Hasia is won't be here for a week. Now, you're going to be pleased to hear why she's not going to be here for a week. She's going up to bring David down from Queensland to his, uh, his um, parish in Hillsville. So David will be down in Victoria, so we, we're very happy for her, aren't we? And just finally, don't forget, if you haven't got you in touch, pick it up from the, the table there. And Arlene will bring us this morning's Bible reading. Thanks, Arlene. Your word, O Lord, is a lamp to our feet. The Easter morning reading is from Mark 16, 1 to 8. The resurrection of Jesus. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, 
had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. After 40 days of long journey of land from Ash Wednesday through Holy Week, including Good Friday, we finally come to the glorious day of Easter and gather this morning to celebrate this joyous Easter of Jesus' resurrection. But our text for today is the story in Mark's Gospel perplexes us. The last verse reports, Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Unlike other Gospels, Matthew, Luke, and John, who have an elaborate story about Jesus' resurrection, Mark's account is so simple that it leaves us with an impression of incomplete ending. Some of you might say that's not the end of Mark's Gospel. It has 12 verses more. It ends verse 20, not verse 8. Yes, it's true. In Mark 16, shorter endings and longer endings are printed in the main text after verse 8. The longer ending is found in verses 9 to 20, and tells of Jesus' encounter with Mary Magdalene and two disciples on the road. It then tells about Jesus' appearance to and commissioning of the 11 disciples and his ascension. Many of us read Mark's Gospel as though the verses 9 to 20 belonged to the original text. But most biblical scholars agree that verse 8 is the original end of Mark's Gospel and that last 12 verses were added on later by someone who clearly believed Mark had not ended his gospel appropriately while copying the original manuscript. So there are numerous later manuscripts of Mark's gospel. Among them, all the earliest manuscripts end right here, verse 8, which means that this is most likely where Mark wanted his story to end. He wanted to conclude it by dangling something unfinished. Why does Mark want to stop here? 
Mark concluded his gospel with the silence of women who were too afraid to speak. Mark certainly knew what greatly good news this was, the news that Jesus was really raised from the dead. Mark undoubtedly knew that these women did not remain silent. Mark was not there at the tomb in person. So if these women had remained silent, Mark would never have known the story. Perhaps these women told Mark the story after some time, or he heard from someone whom the women told. In any case, these women did not remain silent. Then why end his story this way? Let's explore it. Verse 1 reports that very early in the morning, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, came to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body with spices. On their way, they were talking worrisomely to each other about the large stone that blocked the entrance of the tomb. But when they got there, they discovered the stone was already rolled back. They entered the tomb and met an angelic being who told them the best news these women could have imagined. Do not be afraid, he said. Jesus, who was crucified, has been raised. He is not here. Then he gave them clear instructions. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's not, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. But the women did exactly opposite to what the angel ordered them to do. They fled. They fled the tomb in terror and bewilderment. And they said nothing to anyone according to Mark. So these women utterly failed. Do you remember who are pictured as utter failures in the gospel? Women? No. It is Jesus' disciples, Jesus' male disciples. They often misunderstood Jesus. Jesus tried to teach them about his great suffering, trial, death, and raising from the dead. When the disciples heard Jesus' prediction, each time they understood nothing. They ended up stupefied, confused, and even arguing who was the greatest among them and asked Jesus to grant them to sit on his right and left in his glory. What about Peter? Who was the leading disciple? Peter confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, but completely misunderstood what that meant. So contradicted himself by ending up actually rebuking Jesus. During Jesus' trial, Peter denied Jesus three times, and all other disciples ran away, deserting Jesus. By contrast, these three women, as Mark reports in previous chapter, were, among other women, 
who were watching Jesus' crucifixion from a distance. And Mark describes these women like this. These used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. Mark reports that these women were faithful. They did not abandon Jesus in Christ like the other disciples. They followed Jesus to Calvary and thereby witnessed his death, burial, and resurrection. But now, Mark ends his story with these women's failure. Jesus' disciples failed, and these faithful women who up to this point had proved the most faithful of his followers failed too. And then Mark stops. Without telling more detail about detailed stories about Jesus' resurrection that he surely knew. What do we make out of this? Perhaps Mark deliberately ends here in order to invite us, those who read and hear the gospel, into the story to pick up where these women left off and to go and tell that Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified has been raised as the angel announced at the empty tomb. The story of what God is doing in and through Jesus is not over at the empty tomb. It is only beginning. Intentionally ending his gospel with open-ended in the women's failure, Mark calls us to return to the very beginning of his gospel. Do you remember Mark's opening verse of his book in Mark 1.1? It says, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God the beginning of the good news, the beginning. The good news doesn't really have an ending. Resurrection is not a finishing. It is an invitation for a new beginning. Starting from, starting over from where we failed, picking up things that we think we failed. Why did these faithful women fail? Mark says they fled to him because terror and confusion had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. They were afraid. In fact, the fear of the women at the tomb and their silence, even disobedience, made them equal to the other disciples who feared and ran away when Jesus was arrested. But who can blame, who can blame them? for running away. They were terrified and traumatized. Who was Jesus for them? He was more than a teacher for them. He was the tremendous strength and source of hope and purpose to life in that violent, hopeless, and helpless world of first century under the Roman occupation. They, especially these women, watched 
their beloved Jesus being unjustly accused, beaten, mocked, and nailed to the cross and died like a criminal. So they were fearful and greatly distressed. When they came to the tomb, they were caught up in terrible grief. And they had gone to the tomb expecting to encounter nobody. But they found themselves in the presence of an angelic figure, a heavenly being. No wonder they were afraid and fled the tomb in fear. Imagine this. Very early in the morning, at daybreak, you come to this place to pray. You expect to meet no one. You unlock the door and enter inside. And then you see a young man dressed in heavenly white robes sitting on this altar. How would you feel? What would be your response? Extremely exciting and happy? Probably not if you are a normal person. Your first reaction would be fear, don't you think? I will be terrified or even I will have a heart attack by fear. So it's natural response of the women. And Jesus did not blame them for running away. The angel told the women to go and tell his disciples and Peter that Jesus was going ahead of them to Galilee. He mentioned Peter particularly because Peter needed this good news in view of his denial of Jesus three times and his constant despair. Jesus wanted to restore Peter by affirming that Jesus still regarded Peter as one of his leading disciples in spite of his failure. So ending his story in these faithful women's final failure, Mark reminds us that we all fail one way or another. We all miss the mark. So we all need forgiveness. We all need restoration. We all need grace of God. On their way to the tomb, the women worried about the huge stone for they were well aware of their incapability of rolling it away. The stone is a symbol for everything that blocks the way. It may be different for each, but for everyone, it is a large, very large stone. Every one of us has a large stone that blocks our way to follow Jesus. What is your large stone that blocks your way to follow Jesus more faithfully? At the tomb, the stone was already rolled back. Who did it? God. The large stone was rolled away without human effort. If Jesus is really raised from the dead by the power of God, who can say or limit what God can do at work in the world? Writing this open-ended gospel in women's failure 
Mark is telling us that God in Christ meets us precisely at the point where things seem the worst, where we feel inadequate and broken, where we feel like a failure because our stone is too large to push away. And God in Christ restores us by turning what looks like an ending into a new beginning and taking what looks like a failure and offering it back to us an opportunity, as he did to his disciples and the women 2,000 years ago. The women did not remain silent. They went and told the disciples the good news of Jesus Christ because God had rolled away the large stone. With his unfinished gospel, Mark encouraged us to take courage for telling the good news because God is rolling away our large stone that we cannot push away on our own. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Our Christ is truly raised by the power of our God. Amen. And we will play a music video, a song titled, For You, Deep Stillness. We meditate on God's, work, God's love and our Lord Jesus Christ while listening to this song. Thanks, Jeffrey, for this beautiful song. So let's rise to receive our, our blessing. 
Go joyfully into this day that God has made and the Spirit has blessed. The love of God, the companionship of Christ, and the unity of the Spirit will be with you now and forever. Amen. And we will sing, lift high the cross, and we will sing one verse, and then after, after finishing one verse, a uh, couple of people come forward to carry the cross, and then we will follow them while singing the remaining verses hoping you remember you memorize all the verses <laughs>